Dope Agents Podcast. So off camera, we were just having a conversation of a conversation that happened when this particular guest showed up in my email inbox, which, by the way, happens. I get about four to six requests a week to be on our podcast. And I don't think it's anything to do with me. It's got everything to do with lab code agents, of course. But uh, you might know that I actually turn away about 90% of them uh, because nowadays it's just, you know, it's so redundant and topics on real estate are the same thing. And I was just telling our guest today that it's the same old, how to find balance, how to make a million dollars, how to do, you know, how to do these things that, yeah, they all sound great. And I'm sure every guest has a lot of success, but let's talk in the times that we're in and let's be honest, times suck. It's hard. This isn't 2020 and 2021 where you had a pulse and you could close a deal. And our guest today has this story called the $4 story. And I'm going to preface it because I'm actually excited to hear the story. I haven't heard it yet. Is that she lost her house, had literally $4 to her name, and she had to dig out. So without further ado, let's jump in because I think there's a lot of real estate agents right now that feel like they have $4 to their name and they're not sure what the hell they're going to do. And I think this story could inspire some of us. So welcome to the show, Jackie Simmerall Tate. Did I get that right? Is it close you did, Jeff. Good job. Well, welcome. Glad, glad Thank to have you. you. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. So let's just assume we, you know, just like our audience, uh, I, I don't know you. Uh, so tell us your story. Like what, like what led you to where you are today? And obviously let's get down that $4 story, but tell us the story, how you want to tell us. Okay. Well, I think the best way to tell you is that how I got into real estate, I got into real estate in 2002 and I did that when my husband at the time and I were looking at starting our own portfolio of investment properties. And so I started working with a real estate agent who honestly just did not understand what we were trying to accomplish. I don't think she was experienced working with investors. And as a first time investor, I wasn't experienced enough to guide her to what I needed. So at the time I was a stay at home mom and said, you know what, let I'm going to go to real estate school. Let me get my license. I'll represent us ourselves. And when I went to school, I absolutely fell in love with real estate. So by the time I was through that first initial process, I was like, I think this is something I actually want to do uh, for a career. And so that's how I started. And it was 2002. So it was right before, I mean, you mentioned in the intro about, you know, over the last few years, we've been in a time where if you have a pulse, you can make money in real estate. Well, that was also the case in 2003 to 2006. So I got in right before that period of time. And fast forward to the Great Recession. Oh, and 07, I found- 07, 08. 07, 08. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 08 was, the, 08 was the crashing point for me personally. Uh, I was able to kind of hang on until that period of time, but I had a couple of luxury properties in escrow. I was representing the buyer on both of them. And then I don't know, were you in the industry in 08? Since 2000. Okay. So you remember the day the stock market Mm -hmm. tanked in June of 08. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was the, the tipping point and the stock market crashed. Both of my luxury clients Uh, backed out of their deal. And it left me in a place where I was really counting on those two big commissions because things had already started to slow down anyway. And that was the catalyst that led me to my house going into foreclosure. So I short sold my house. At the time I was now divorced. I was a single mom. I had two elementary age kids. And so I, you know, packed up my household items, my kids and my pride and moved back in with my parents. Wow. So, yeah. And, and so let me ask you, let me digress. What did you do before real estate? Marketing and advertising was okay. my background. So, you know, I just, during that period of time, I definitely dusted that off. You got to be willing to duck and weave. And so I was doing some marketing, uh, you know, working with some small businesses and helping them with their marketing to try and help you know, pay the bills while I was trying to reinvent myself in the real estate world. Yeah. 
Okay, so now let's jump back to 08 when things crashed. And I, I mean, what more could go wrong? You know, <laughs> it's, you, you lost the deals, you're divorced, you're single mom, like the chips are stacked against. Um, and that pride of moving back home, I guarantee there's a lot of real estate professionals that, you know, you're at that place, at the place of maybe not moving back in with mom and dad, but do I need to go get a normal a nine to five job again? So what happened next? So I, I agree with you, Jeff, where I felt like that was it. That was the bottom. I didn't know there was more to come. And so I really did move back in with them thinking, okay, just, I just need a few months to regroup and I'll be right back up on my feet. Not a problem, but it wasn't just me going through the hard times. It was the entire nation globally, yeah. the world, everything. It was a tough time. And so to try and reinvent myself was a hard, uh, a hard road to hoe. And that was when I actually did get down to my last $4. So while I'm thinking it's going to be a few months in my parents' house, it turned into two and a half years before I was able to get up on my feet and take my girls, get back into, uh, we rented a three-bedroom apartment. And I got to tell you, that three-bedroom apartment felt like a palace at the time. But it was right, right in the middle of that two and a half years that I woke up, I had a bank account that was overdrawn, another bank account that was right at zero, and I had four single dollar bills in my wallet. That was it. And I So technically <clears throat> you're technically you were in the negative at that point. Oh, technically, yeah. I mean, let's not talk about my debt and my negative bank account. I mean, I was I think by the the time we kind of got out of pulled myself out of the hole, I was six figures in debt for sure. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so those four dollars though, that was all that was the, all the um currency I had at the moment. And as a single mom, you know, it really hit. I was very blessed to have my parents who were at least helping keep a roof over our head and keeping us fed. But that day I woke up, I had a business meeting, a coffee meeting later, and uh, I can still remember showing up to Starbucks and just ordering a venti water because there was no way I was spending that last four bucks on coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I met with this person who was a friend, a business associate, but also a friend. And as we're in the middle of talking, we're doing a networking kind of referral based thing. And he looked at me and goes, okay, what gives? And, oh, well, what do you mean? He goes, I don't know. You're not yourself. And so it really did get to the point where I couldn't, the stress of where I was at, I couldn't even hide anymore. And I am not the kind of person to wear my troubles on my sleeve. And so it really hit me that I even decided to open up to him. I didn't tell him the whole story. I didn't tell him about the $4. But at the time, because we had moved back in with my parents, my kids had to switch and go to a new school. And their previous school, they wore uniforms. They were in private school. Now they were going to public school and I had to buy them school clothes and I had no money to do so. And so that was the stress point that I opened up to uh, my friend about. And so he reached into his wallet and he had $300 on him and he gave it to me. And he said, listen, go buy your kids some clothes, get them ready for school. And I said, listen, I will pay you back. I so appreciate this. And he said, no, I don't want you to pay it back. I want you to pay it forward. And so that moment of kindness changed the trajectory of my life. And at the same time, another friend had gifted me um, a six CD set. I'm totally aging myself here, but it was a six CD set of Les Brown's Choosing Your Future. So I don't know if you all know who Les Brown is. He is one of the greatest motivational speakers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had his six CDs on my six CD changer in my car, and I would listen to that uh, kind of nonstop. And so between those two friends who one helped me financially and one helped me with something that truly put my mindset into a different place, I can tell you it, it changed who I am and how I show up. And, and this was, was what, what year did this happen? So the Ford, so I moved in with my parents in 2000, uh, late 2008. And this happened in 2009. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 15 years ago. Yep. All right. Yeah. Continue. Well, from that point on, I, so basically, like I said, I was working with some small companies doing some marketing for them uh, to, while I'm trying to reinvent myself in the real estate world. 
And at that time, I I think it was about a week after that, that somebody had an outstanding invoice that they paid because here's, <laughs> here's the flaw. I mean, here I am a real estate agent with my fallback career in marketing and I'm doing this <laughs> in a great recession. And so, you know, when people had to make the decision, do I pay the marketing invoice or do I keep the lights on? They're keeping the lights on. And so my, the work I had been doing wasn't coming, you know, I mean, I, I was getting it done, but I wasn't getting necessarily paid on time. So I did have somebody who was able to pay their outstanding invoice, which breathed a little bit of oxygen. I don't know if you guys uh, remember in the movie, Will Smith's movie, Pursuit of Happiness, and he's really down on his luck and he gets to a point, he's just trying to sell these clunky medical machines. And in the movie, he sells one. And when he sells it, he goes, that was six weeks of oxygen. And that's how I felt when I when this marketing invoice got, got paid. I went, oh, I got a little bit of oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to take that, you know, quote unquote oxygen, pursue a couple of things. I was, you know, and again, you have to be willing, ready, willing, and able to duck and weave. You don't take your eyes off the prize but you have to do what you have to do in the meantime. So I was able to actually connect with a tech startup. They hired me as a community manager. It got me back up on my feet. And that's how I was able to, you know, rent the rent the uh, palace apartment, as I call it for me and my girls. Okay. So then, you know, what, it, well, by the way, and it was, I think it was ir ironic that the friend who loaned you the money said to pay it forward at the place it's kind of notorious for people paying forward. Like you pull up to the window and the person in front of you paid for your drink. It's kind of funny how that happened. <laughs> that's true. I never even put those two things together, but you're right. <laughs> when you said that, I was like, oh, that's funny that it happened at Starbucks. That, oh, that's a good pay forward right there. <laughs> so, all right. So now you get a day job, a nine to five job, um, which which I think there's a lot of of agents listening to this that have already done that. Mm -hmm. uh, or are thinking about doing that. So how does that progress? So from there, I kind of took my eyes off of real estate for a little bit. And I thought, all right, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be in real estate. Maybe I'm supposed to really focus on marketing. I ended up starting to work with a lender in, and helping them with marketing. So I got to marry my marketing and my real estate experience together. So that did start to draw me back into to real estate a little bit. But during this time, I had been, you know, working with a lender, working with some other things. I was coaching realtors in their marketing. So I never really got out of real estate completely, but I did stop selling for a little while. And then, um, you know, after being back up on my feet and doing all these things, I uh, ended up, I met my husband and my now husband. We got married. We're we just celebrated 11 years. Uh, anniversary. And it was shortly after we got married that we had the opportunity to move full time from Flagstaff. So all of this happened while I lived in Scottsdale. And uh, and so we took the opportunity to move to Flagstaff. And when we did, I said, you know what, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump back into real estate wholeheartedly and try, you know, I thought, well, I'd been coaching agents. So I thought, well, you know what, either I'm going to go back, I'm going to do everything I say to do. And I'm going to start from scratch because I knew two people in Flagstaff and they were both in real estate. So I said, you know what, I'm either going to prove that what I am teaching works, or I'm going to prove that I don't know what I'm talking about. And I better find a different career. <laughs> so, yeah. what, you, what year was this? 2014. All right. And so what were you teaching? So for real estate agents and for small businesses, I was doing little seminars. This was the, you know, pre-Zoom. And so I'd go mm. live to different brokerages, things like that. And I was teaching about social media and sphere of influence and, marketing. And this, is, this is before social was anything like it is today. Basically Facebook. Absolutely. Yeah. Basically Facebook. That was all you had. <laughs> so cool. I, I want to hear about this. Yeah. So, I mean, my whole thing is, is about relationship. I mean, I can tell you that where I'm at today, my book of business is over 90% referral based. I don't, I have a team, so we do a lot of marketing, but I don't personally work with the people who necessarily come in through the marketing unless it's a specific need. But um, my 
whole trajectory is all about building relationships, working within your sphere of influence. But more than that, I think a lot of people who talk about working with your sphere of influence, it's all about, well, what can you get? What can you get from your sphere? How can you position yourself to be their go-to? Whereas I have an a kind of a different way to look at that in terms of, well, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? How can I help you? You know, I've got the dream uh, board up behind me. And I think that through this whole trajectory, what I learned is that who I was as a real estate professional prior to my $4 story is I think I was a very much a transactional paycheck player. And what I learned through shifting, being at the bottom and having to reinvent myself, and then also having the opportunity to get my mindset shifted, is that I really did learn that it's not about me. It's about other people. And how can I show up with my gifts and talents and help other people get their dreams to come true? And I think by doing that, that's what helps to create relationships where people trust you and then uh, you build your your business from there. It's not that you don't care about building your business. It's just that having a successful business becomes the the award in and of itself, not the goal. Mm-hmm. So, g- can you can you give us some some uh, you know tangible or tactical things that you were teaching back then uh, about? marketing and and attraction and gaining business and and maybe even specifically as it relates to Facebook? Well, yeah. So my whole thing is I do a, when I teach these classes, I have what's called a relationship timeline. And so how you treat the people that come into your world depends on where they fall in the relationship timeline. So you have the complete cold, you know, internet lead, you're paying Zillow, you're paying realtor.com, you're paying whoever, and they come in and they don't know you from anyone. And that's going to be at the farthest end of your relationship timeline, because you really have to work to build that trust to bring them to a point where you're, you can even say you have a professional relationship with them, so on and so forth. So from Facebook, or now we would say any social media, they're going to be a little bit farther down that timeline, but it's, you know, they're seeing your highlight reels and you want them to see your reel. You see what I'm saying? Like you need to be real with people Mm -hmm. and it's not about your highlight reel. And so it's about, well, how do you reach out to them and find out more? How do you, back then what I would teach people to do is I use a system called send out cards and I would teach people to go on Facebook and when they would post a picture of their grandbaby or their, you know, their daughter who was graduating high school or their new house or whatever it was that they were celebrating in their highlight reel, to download that picture, put it on the front of a card, get their physical address if you didn't already have it and mail them either a congratulations or if it was that a pet passed away, I would I would email, I would mail them a card with a picture of their pet and um, the poem about the rainbow bridge or, you know, things like that. Really just looking to how can I make a difference? How can I make you smile today? How can I make you feel seen today? And when you do that, then this is what puts people into your world where now they want to see you back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's a real is greater than real. R E A L is greater than R E E L. Exactly. That is a tweet or a thread right there. <laughs> um, I love it. So, all right. Now, how does that articulate? How does that, I mean, I understand what you mean. Uh, I assume the audience understands what you mean. Uh, Facebook was a different world back then than it is today. And I do want to fast forward to what today looks like versus versus then. But um, how does that articulate? You know, how do you, how do you execute that? Uh, in terms of for, for, business, for business, like how do yeah. you turn this like, yeah. okay, let's yeah. serve others and now we need uh, business. Well, so here's where here's where it comes in. I don't look at my sphere of influence, my database, anybody who makes their way into my follow-up boss does not just become like a potential deal. The way that I look at this is, okay, these are the people that I'm going to call. I know that with my real estate expertise, I have knowledge, I have expertise, 
and I have the ability to help them negotiate a very stressful time in their life. So if they are thinking of buying or selling, I know that I can help take some of the stress away and I can be of service to them. So when I start to call people who have made their way into my database, whether it's because on Facebook, we've created this warm, fuzzy relationship that I told you about, whether it's because we have a warm, fuzzy relationship because they're one of my best friends, or they are just an internet lead that came in at some point. I'm not looking at it like, okay, how can I get a listing? How can I get a buyer? How can I get, get, get? I'm looking at it as, hey, I know that if you have this need, I can help you. Mm -hmm. So that's where now my systems come into place, where my systems tell me who I need to follow up with, how long it's been since we've talked. I have different campaigns that remind me if they're in my sphere of influence, I get a reminder to touch base with them on a minimum once a quarter. And so whether it's a phone call, a text message, uh, uh, you know, I still use send out cards, sending them a card, whatever that looks like, uh, that's where it comes into play, where now they know that I'm here to serve them. When I call them, I'm going to still connect with them. I'm still letting them know, hey, I am in real estate, but it's not from a perspective of like, hey, what do you got? Who do you know? It's more of a perspective of, oh, you have a need? How can I serve? Mm -hmm. Love it. So- at what point does the turnaround happen? I will tell you the financial turnaround really did happen in Flagstaff because that's when I said I'm going back into the real estate sales full time. Uh, up until that point, I had stayed really focused on marketing. Like I said, I had connected with a lender. So I was able to help realtors with their marketing. That was the lender would pay me to go help their realtors market and get more business so they would get more loans. Mm -hmm. And it was a great job and I loved doing it. I represented very a great company and some great loan officers. Uh, but when I moved to Flagstaff, I said, you know what? Let's put our, you know, put your money where your mouth is kind go of thing. Go do it yourself. Yeah. Go yeah. do it yourself, you yeah. know? And so that's what I did. And I really, I made the commitment. And I think that's the key there is that after that whole time, I had been a little afraid to get back into sales. Um, I was comfortable and I didn't want to try and be uncomfortable again, but I did it and I went full force. So first it started with the mindset of this is what I am, I am now. I'm real estate full time. I'm hitting the ground running. I'm doing all the things I know to do. And, uh, and yeah, so, I mean, my first year in Flagstaff, again, knowing nobody, I sold 7 million and that was in 2014. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to accomplish even that was like, all right, maybe I'm onto something here. Yeah. And so by, um, by 2019, then I was, you know, hitting that top 1% within my brokerage nationwide. And I've stayed there every year since. Um, was able to build a team, you know, all, all the things, like you yeah. said, it's, yeah. you know, it's the story everybody's got to tell. And again, it's not about like, oh, look at me, I'm doing so awesome. It's more about, I put my mind into it. I created the habits in the system. So now I got my mindset, right. I got my systems and habits, right. And I'm showing up on purpose in my purpose. I'm not showing up as the paycheck player anymore. And I think that my, the, my book of business reflects that. Yeah. So what would you say to the agent who's listening to this and, you know, they're, they're negative right now. They're the negative Nancy. Maybe they are Nancy. Um, no <laughs> offense to any Nancy's out there, but they're thinking like, eh, okay, it's a different time. This was a different kind of crash than 07 and 08. All right. Like you got lucky. All right. Well, you're the anomaly. You're the unicorn. I don't see any way out. Cause you know how it is when you're down in the dumps, it's like, it's, you got the worst life in the world and, and it's, it's hard to mentally dig yourself out. So somebody comes to you and says, I don't know how to do it. And times are completely different now. Um, what do you advise them? You are, you are hitting right to the core of why I even share my $4 story right now, because if I could just say one thing is to look into your world and you have to look up, like, I think right now you're looking down, you're looking in, you're, you're looking to the inside of everything that's going on. And if I could encourage you in one thing, it's to put your eyes onto the horizon and fight for what you see. Ask yourself, 
where am I? Where do I want to be in a year from now? Where do I want to be 10 years from now? And not only that, but to really dig in and say, how is this period of time going to serve a higher purpose? And if you can connect with that, then you're going to be able to get through this. If you can look at those at these hard times and say to yourself, okay, this is teaching me something. This is going to be for my benefit in the future. This is going to be for my client's benefit or my, my family's benefit, my friend's benefit. Whatever that looks like on your horizon, know that this is going to, going to benefit that portion of your story. That is honestly going to be step number one. And I'm not saying that that makes it easier. It doesn't. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that when I went through my $4 story and my friend helped me and then I got, you know, like I wasn't like, oh, yay. Okay. This is great. It'll, everything's going to be fine. No, there were plenty of days where I would break down and we're talking crying, like ugly cry. I don't know how I'm going to get through this uh, type of a situation, but if you can look forward and know that this is going to serve a higher purpose in the future and work towards what is that higher, what does that future look like where I am using this as a catalyst, that's going to be the first thing that's going to make a difference. And then the second reason why I'm sharing this is because we are, we're in a shifting market and we are experiencing things that if you got into the, if you got into this industry within the last 10 years, you've never seen anything like this. And I want to help to encourage you. Let me tell you what I was doing wrong when I hit my $4. I didn't have habits and systems in place. I was more of a transactional, oh, look at me. I did let my ego lead the way. And I do think there's a lot of ego in real estate and it is a disservice to you. As you, you know, if you're leading with ego, it's a disservice to you. It's also a disservice to your clients. So Let's work on that. Let's work on your mindset. Ask yourself, why? Why are you showing up in real estate? Why do you want this? What is your why? And it's got to be higher than, oh, well, I want to have X amount of transactions or I want to have X amount of GCI. Those are goals. That's fine. Have goals. But you have to have a bigger underlying why as to what you're doing. Why are you showing up? Why this? Why this industry? And so if you have that purpose driving the fire underneath you, and then you have the habits and systems in place that are supporting what you want to accomplish, you're going to get through this because people have to live somewhere. People move, people get job opportunities. They have to downsize, they have to upsize, they have to move into a different market. They have to uh, have a family member move in. So now they need a multi-generational solution. There are a lot of reasons why people move in any market. So you have to be in a position where you're putting yourself in the way of that. And yeah, it does become a little bit more difficult. That's where your systems and habits come in. So how about, and I'm gonna put you on the spot here. What about if you had to say, okay, uh, this a lot of motivational stuff that you're saying right now, and mm -hmm. that's all very necessary, but that's not gonna get me over the hump or pay my bills. And so if I'm where you were, somewhere in that bubble, maybe not four dollars, but you know, bad. Mm -hmm. What are three things I should be doing today, tomorrow to get myself out, not mentally, mm -hmm. uh, physically, you know, tactfully, tangi tangibly, what should I be doing? What, give me three things that I should focus on. So here's what I train. So I, I train at Realty One Group Mountain Desert. I coach our new agents. We just had this conversation on Monday and I'm going to share with you what I shared with them because this is the tactics of it. It's you like have I was a fly on the wall, huh? Yeah, it is. I <laughs> like nice. <laughs> but also, um, well, that's a tangent. I'm not gonna go down a tangent. Let me give you the answer. Here's the three tactical things you can do right now. First and foremost, you have to have a database in in play. And when I say a database, what I'm talking about is your CRM. Yeah. I personally use follow-up boss, um, but with most brokerages. You have access to a CRM that you can plug into either for free or very inexpensive. 
start getting yourself organized. And if you're like, you know what? I don't want, forget KV core, forget follow-up boss, forget sync. I don't want any of that. Then by all means, use Excel, use an Excel spreadsheet, but you have to get yourself organized and have your people in some type of a system where you can go through and know who you've contacted and keep notes. I, one of the things that people love about me when I call them, maybe it's been five years since I talked to somebody, but five years ago, I talked to them and their son was starting his freshman year. And so maybe now five years later, I can say, Hey, how is Johnny doing? He's probably in college by now. How, you know, how did that go? And oh my gosh, you remember Johnny and you remember what phase he's in. So if you don't have a system where you can keep track of that, certainly you can't keep it all up in your head. I promise you, I'm not remembering what Johnny's doing five years from now, if I don't have it written down somewhere. So let me so ask that's, a follow, let me ask a follow-up question to that one. So uh, the database, and let's just say, uh, because I'm usually blown away by this, because you would assume this is a, everyone should have one, right? But I'm always blown away when people are like, no, I don't have that. I'm like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. All right. When thinking about a database, what is what does that database look like? And let's assume we're talking about not a veteran. We're talking about somebody that's been in the business two to five years. They've had moderate success. Um, and so what does that database consist of beyond past customers? That's the most obvious one. What else, who else should they be thinking about that belongs on this? And I'm going to say it spreadsheet, because I think in, if you're at $4, you can't afford FUB, right? So what, who, sh who goes on the spreadsheet? Everybody who is in, and I don't have my phone on me right now because I put it away knowing I want an, an uninter uninterrupted time with you, or I would show you. you everybody who's living in your contact list on your phone needs to be transferred over to your spreadsheet or your database. That's first and foremost. And it doesn't matter how you know that person. They made their way into your phone contacts at some point. So that's the where you start. Is, is there a geographic bubble around that? Am I no. putting, am I, if I'm in Missouri, am I putting my aunt in, in uh, Virginia in, in that list? Absolutely. Because your aunt in Virginia may have a friend who needs to move to Missouri or your aunt in Virginia has a friend who she's been recruiting to come and work with her in Virginia who lives in Missouri. The other thing is, is your aunt in Virginia may need to move, uh, may, may need to move in Virginia and you have the opportunity to create a referral to a trusted agent who you know. I will tell you, I have a friend that I just visited in the Dallas area. I am not licensed in Texas by any means, uh, but I went to her house, was able to see her beautiful home. She's a recent empty nester. And so she and her husband are considering possibly selling in the next three to five years. And she specifically said to me, Jackie, when it's time, I'm coming to you so you can refer me to a Dallas agent. So how silly if I just decided, well, I'm not going to put her into my spreadsheet or my database or my contact list. So yeah, no geographical Love bubbles. It. Love it. All right, carry on. Were you done with the database part? Are we on to number two or did I cut yeah. you off? Okay. No, nope, that's go. great. So that's, for, that's first and foremost. Oh, well, you did ask where else you get people. So I will say it does start with your contact mm -hmm. list in your phone. Mm -hmm. And then it does go to people who you're connected to in social media. It goes to any internet leads, company leads, any, you know, all of these different things. There's such a wealth of where you can find people. Mm -hmm. um, so we won't necessarily go into that, but know that it is more than just your contact list in your phone, but that's where you start. So it, it goes to a database and I'm going to, I'm going to add something here only because I'm clearly a social guy. Um, take that database and I know you're going to give some ideas here, but go freaking connect with them, find them on socials and I'll let you take it from there. Yes, Jeff, you're, yes, you're a hundred percent. I agree with you. Uh, so that's technique number one, Okay. get your people organized. Technique number two is you've got to come up with a habit of contacting these people. Now, one of the things that what we were talking about, there was a study done by um, Curator. I don't, I'm sure you know who they are. Mm -hmm. So Curator did a study. They made a certain number of dials. They were able to break it down to the ridiculous. And here's the results. For every 100 people you call, you can set two appointments. 
Now, basically the way it came out is out of 100 people, 29 people are actually going to answer your phone call. Of those 29, 50%, you're going to get into some form of a conversation and they judge this by who stayed on the phone talking to you longer than 30 seconds. So 50%, so basically 14, 15 people will actually get into a conversation with you. And of those people, two of them are willing to meet with you, whether to have a buyer consultation or a listing appointment. Hmm. So if those are the numbers, now let me let me put this into a context where I think in any market, this makes sense. I don't care what your median price point is. I don't care if you're selling cheap land in Northern Arizona or you're selling million dollar mansions, you know, anywhere else. Here's what you have. If you know that to make two appointments, you need to make a hundred dials. If you made, 10 dials a day. And I'm a big believer in work-life balance. So I tell people only do the habits of real estate five days a week. You're going to be reactional on those other couple of days. You may have to show property or go on appointments or things like that, but you're making prospecting calls five days a week. So if I'm going to make 10 dials a day, it'll take me two weeks to get to those 100 dials. So if it's going to take me two weeks to get to 100 dials and I know that I'm going to book two appointments out of 100 dial, that is an average of one appointment per week, 52 appointments for the year. So let's say I am horrible at converting an appointment into a piece of business and I only have a 50% close rate. At a 50% close rate, I would close 26 transactions off mm -hmm. of those 52 appointments. And all of that breaks down to simply doing 10 dials a day. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do that. So if you can create that system, create it now because the work you do today pays you 30, mm -hmm. 60, 90 days from now, three years from now, 10 years from now. You have to fill that pipeline, but you do it by creating the habit of dialing the phone 10 times a day. That makes sense, um, obviously. And and most agents would say if they could close 26 deals, it'd be their best year ever, I'm pretty sure, uh, just knowing the data, right? And knowing how many deals have closed this last year and how many agents there are, like you just do the math, right? Um, now... What about those two people that you make an appointment with? That's okay. So it's 52. Uh, we're, you're going to assume a 26, 50% conversion for 26. But we all know that of those people, the vast majority of them are going to require drip. Mm -hmm. So I can't afford a CRM how, what is my best form of follow-up with that in mind? Oh, well, this is going to, this is going to take you off on a whole different tangent. Uh, and I still got to get to number three, but right. here's what I will tell you, but no, I'm going to go there okay. because this is, you're hitting gold right now, Jeff. So I don't want to, I don't want to ignore it. But what I can tell you is that if you need to connect with people and drip on them and try and stay top of mind, with somebody for 30, 60, 90 days, two years, 10 years, whatever the case may be, and you have no money to do it, you have your phone and you have a camera in that phone and you can create video to send to these people individually. One of my most successful things is I, I don't always post on Facebook, happy birthday with a little emoji or whatever. I get on my phone and if I don't have their phone number to text it to them direct, I will send it via Facebook Messenger or what have you, whatever whatever way I have to connect with them. And I will sing them happy birthday. And I sing the fast version. Y'all don't sing the slow version, okay? Like happy birthday to you, not happy birthday. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So that they actually listen to you. Yeah. And I literally send it to them and say, hey, I was just thinking about you on your birthday. I'm the only person doing that, I promise you. And the response I get from these people. So this is a way that you're going to stay in touch with them at minimum once a year. But then you have other things to do. And I mean, I've got a whole list of things that I either text people, send on Facebook Messenger, or will use as an opening as a phone call uh, in order to get in touch with them. And it's conversational. And again, it's about them. 
It's not about me. Hey, you thinking about selling or buying? No, yeah. that's never my message. Right. That goes back to the spreadsheet. That goes back to the spreadsheet with the notes mm -hmm. and being intentional about the questions you ask. And really, you should be intentional about asking questions that for, that allow you to follow up. What's your anniversary? What's your kids' birthdays? What's your pets' birthdays? What's your favorite teams? What's your favorite restaurants? What's your favorite holiday? Like, right? I mean, sky's the limit. All you're doing is giving yourself an excuse to reach out to them, send them something, whatever. Right. And, and differentiate it's as simple as that. It's simple. Yeah. It's simple, but it's not easy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, life gets busy. This is the number one reason real estate agents don't do these things is because our, our business tends to be reactive. So, uh, there is a saying, James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, that uses that I absolutely connect with, resonate with, and it and it's like a, a pillar for me and my business, is that people don't rise to the level of their goals, they fall to the level of their systems. So that's why my systems are in place. My My database reminds me every day who I need to call. Because of the way that I keep track of everything, I wake up in the morning and I have an email that says, call this person, call that person, send a CMA out to here, make sure you can, you know, I mean, so that's what my system does. But again, if you're doing the spreadsheet and you don't have that system set up, what I used to use when I started doing systems is Google Calendar. I would literally, I would have a conversation with someone. I'll give you an example. I had a conversation with somebody who had contacted me. They were thinking about selling their house in Williams, Arizona. It was a rental property. And so when we crunched the data, she didn't really like what she could get. So she decided she's going to rent it out for one more year. And would I check back in with her uh, in about 10 months before that tenant would be up and let's reevaluate the system. So this was before I had follow-up boss. I literally went into my Google calendar. I set an appointment for myself and in the little notes section of the appointment on my Google calendar, I said, here's who you're calling. Here's why you're calling. Pull a CMA on this address before you call. And I literally did that like every year. She still owns that rental. I still touch base with her every year to see where she's at. Does she mm. want to do, you know, I mean, so eventually when she's ready to sell and not rent, I'd be, I, I'd be shocked if she went with anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. So well, yeah. You're, all right. We got to, we got to wrap her up. Okay. We got one more to go. <laughs> we got one more to go. That's right. All right. So. Um, of all the things that we've really said, I do think that it's important, tactically speaking, so you've got your system set up, you're making your phone calls, we talked about how you keep track and you follow up with these people. And then the third thing is truly to hold, hold make- Hold on real, real quick, before you yeah. go there, and I don't necessarily want you to answer this in depth, I just want to know, do you have a cadence? Do you have a calendar? You know, a, a text on Monday, an email on Wednesday, a, a, a video message next month, you know, like, do you do so? Do you have something like that? Uh, not that I use for individual contacts. I have a I have a follow up thing that tells me exactly what I'm going to do. And when I put plug people into it, it reminds me on a quarterly basis to get in touch with them if I haven't already. But here's the here's the key. And, and honestly, this this will be the third thing. And I'll leave you with this mm -hmm. is that when you have a conversation with them, get permission to call them again get permission to send them a text, get permission to follow up, make sure they understand what you're going to be doing next. Here's why we get up in our heads a lot. And now if somebody says to me this morning, hey, can you set me up on a drip on MLS so I can see properties this afternoon? No problem. That's easy to keep track of. But what happens with the person who says to me, hey, will you will you follow up with me in 10 months and let's reevaluate? On the phone with her, the first time I said, okay, so that puts us in May. Um, so May of next year, I am going to give you a call. Does that sound fair? Absolutely. Okay. Put it on my calendar. So guess what? When I called her in May, I did put her on my email newsletter and all that stuff. But when I called her in May, I said, Hey, this is Jackie. I'm calling for our check-in that we, we talked about when we last talked in July. So 
you don't have the thing in your head that tells you, oh, I'm going to bother them. Oh, they're not going to want to hear from me. Nobody ever answers their phone. I'm going to catch them in the middle of dinner. I can't call them now because they're at work. Well, then after work, I can't call them because they're doing dinner. And then after dinner, it's too late. So you get in the you get into your head and you start to give yourself all sorts of excuses as to why you can't follow up with this person. So let them know they're going to hear from you again. Just this morning, I connected with somebody, put them on an MLS trip. I said, listen, start looking at the market, start getting to know this. I know, you know, we she had shared her timeline with me. She's not in a hurry. And I said, so take a look at these things. If you find a property that you like, definitely reach out to me. But if I don't hear from you in two weeks, I am going to give you a call at the end of next week. Is that okay? She agreed. So now guess what? At the end of next week, when it's time for me to call her, I don't have the garbage in my head that goes, oh, she's not going to want to hear from me. What if she found another agent? She hasn't contacted me in two weeks. So now do you see where I'm going with that? Mm -hmm. So it really is uh, about that getting permission. It's called it, you know, in sales speak, it's called an upfront contract. And so you've made an agreement with these people. So they understand that they're going to be hearing from you. And if you can put those three things in line you don't have to have a dollar for marketing. You don't. You can use all your free social media stuff and create your presence that way. All you have to have is time and intentionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. So today, um, where are you at? What'd you guys do in 2023? So 2023, we uh, finished up top producer in our Flagstaff office, top 1% of our Realty One group nationwide. And uh, that was the fifth year, fifth year in the row, fifth year in a row that we were top 1%, third year in a row that we were top team in our office. Um, and yeah, so that's- That's awesome. That's, what, is that, what does that equate to? And I know it was a down year, um, but everybody was down. So I'm just curious, like what is, like I want to give people hope. And, hmm. you know, like this is this is where you can go. And, and you know, believe me, I want to quote stats from 2020 and 2021 because 2023 are not the same, but it's still it was, you know, comparatively, it was still a great year. Right. You one hmm. percent. But so what, what, what was it in 23? So in 23, we actually sold 59 units, whereas like if you were going to compare that to what you were saying, like, oh, yeah, yeah I want to quote yeah. 2021, 2021, we sold uh, 76 units. Okay. I was going to ask you, what's your best year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. What, what's what's that volume where you are? So where we're at in Northern Arizona, you got to understand, we are not at a price point like we used to be in Scottsdale. So this year we sold 30 million at the 59 units. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's great. I mean, and that's, I think that's, that's the bigger point here is, is, you know, you, you've, you've heard this story and, um, I, I just, I just hope it gives somebody hope, uh, because, you know, in fact, I just read an article, uh, just this week in Riz media and it was their January publication. I encourage anybody to go check it out, go online. You don't have to pay for it. Just go to the top, click on more, look at publications, look at the January edition and go find the article two pager with Brian Buffini and, uh, the economist for NAR and look at their outlook for 24. Now I know it's a speculation, but these are two pretty respected names in the industry. And I promise you, after you get done reading that, you're going to have a lot of hope. Um, first quarter is going to suck. It's going to continue to suck, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of hope. And, and um, you know, it, it, I, I, I want to ask you this. I'm not going to say what I would say, cause I want to know what you would say, but you know, anybody who's hung on this long, Mm -hmm. um, but they're on, they're hanging on by a thread of a thread of a thread. What do you tell them? So if you've listened to this whole podcast, you're here with me right now and you are just literally got one foot out the door. You've already got your application in at Starbucks. You're ready to just throw in the towel. The one thing that I would tell you is why haven't you yet connect with that? because there's a reason you're still here. You love this industry. You love the promise of this industry. You know you have what it takes to be successful in this industry. So there's a reason you're still hanging on. There's a reason you listen to the end of this podcast and why you haven't left yet. And so the number one thing, I know it's motivational and maybe a little woo-woo, but connect with your why. Because once you do that, that's going to give you the fortitude to really dig in. And then the second thing I would tell you is 
can you do the 10 dials a day? Can you mm -hmm. do it? Because if you can, I promise you 12 months from now, it's going to be a whole different story. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody wants to connect with you. How do they do so? Best way to do it is to go to steps to strength.com. That's where you, you're going to find all the links for my books, for my coaching program, for my real estate. You find out, you find out anything you want to know about me. The, the YouTube channel I do with my husband, you'll find it all. And if they want to message you, how do they if do they, that? Yeah. If they want to message me, go to Instagram. And I promise you, I know my name is long and hard to spell, but if you even get close, you will find me. It's Jackie Semerel Tate and send me a direct message there. And if you send me a direct message with the word relationship 24, then we will send you the, our three, uh, our three step strategy to creating a referral based business. Well, I just followed you. So yeah. nice. there you go. We're connected and I found I you it. very easily. So. Awesome. Jackie, it has been a pleasure. Uh, it is a fun story. Now, let me ask you this. Have you formally paid it ahead, paid it forward, the, the $300? Tenfold. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for being on. It's an inspiration. And hopefully uh, somebody walks away and says, all right, the thread just got a little thicker. I'm going to hang in there. So awesome. Thank you so much. It was great to connect. Great to meet you. And uh Hopefully we stay in touch. I love that. Thanks, Jeff. Black Coat Agents Podcast.